right? Until you've been in SSA half the time. I applaud you guys and Mr. Tim Larrick. Glad you guys are here. Um, you haven't lived until you've looked a grown man and I and talked about like teat placement on the cow's udders, right? Anybody ever do that? Yes? No? Maybe so? Harley Pro team, any FFA nerds? Raise your hand. woo Yeah! No, that's exciting. Be proud of that. Um, but seriously, FFA, great times. Uh, glad you guys are here. I want, to, I want you to picture this today. Hot summer day, okay? And, and thousands of people have flooded a, a water park. And uh, at most water parks, there are just only a certain number of chairs and tables and that kind of thing ever been in one of those moments and, and so a lot of the water park employees they they do their best to just kind of keep traffic moving and flowing and they'll post signs and and remind those water park attendants you know to to kind of pick your stuff up and move on when you're finished eating and and not using that area anymore and 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 you know how it goes there are those specific people in life who think it's their sole responsibility to just set up camp and not move all day long, right? And there are rule followers and there are rule breakers. Let's see a show of hand for the rule followers in the house. Let's see a show of hand for the rule breakers in the house. You're not real rule breakers because you raised your hand, yeah? right? So anyway, there's this one specific lady who set up shop. She's pulled two tables together and about eight chairs and she's just spread her belongings all over the place, not leaving room for anybody else. She's got her beach towels hanging there and her beach bag and several books and drinks and food just spread out everywhere. And a water park employee strolls by and she reminds the lady, ma'am, we need you to to finish up and clear these tables so other guests can sit here. She just rolls her eyes and doesn't budge. 20 minutes later, that same water park employee strolls by and she says again, ma'am, please Please finish up and clear these tables so that other guests can use them. And uh, the lady just just uh, says, we'll see. Right? 20 minutes later, same exact situation. Water park employee walks by and says, ma'am, we would appreciate it if you would allow other guests to use these tables. And the woman just again rolls her eyes and scoffs and, and, and doesn't budge. Another 20 minutes goes by. Same water park employee says, okay, I'm going to have to ask you politely. I like when people say that. I'm going to ask you politely. I'm going to have to ask you politely to get up and move. We've had families wandering around all day long looking for a place to sit, and and they've all walked past you, and you refuse to get up. So, ma'am, we're going to have to ask you to evacuate these tables and chairs and let someone else use them. And she... She gets her tankini in a twist and chair lady fires back with, well, you do you, but unless you turn into somebody important, I am not going anywhere. It's hard in moments like that to bite your tongue, agree? And it's in times like that when I need Jesus' reminders, places like Matthew 5, just after Jesus says this, which is our memory verse for the week. He goes on to sharing six different illustrations about how we often think one way about our moral dilemmas, but he's asking us to think a different way. Here's an example. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Jesus elevates that moral dilemma. He goes on in verse uh, 33. He says again, You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool. He says, You have heard that it was said, Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn turn to him the other also. And then he says this, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do you love your enemies? Jesus throws these situations out here and it rubs us all kinds of the wrong way. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Think with me about the most religious person you know. And conjure up an image of a person that you know in your mind. Maybe this person 
always seems to make the right decision. Know anybody like that? Hey, they don't cuss, chew, or run with girls who do. They don't gossip or say bad stuff about other people. All right, they're great with their finances. You know, some of the most religious people, you know, they're great with their finances. They don't have this baggage of debt that they're carrying around. And, and they seem to give when there's a need. And they love helping other people financially. All right, the most religious people that you can think of, they probably have a really organized home. Right? Everything just seems to be in its proper place. And, and everybody inside their family gets along. Right, the most religious people, you know, they probably read their Bible on a daily basis and they pray before every single meal and at other times throughout the day. Right, the most religious people you probably know, they, they hardly ever miss a Sunday morning worship service like this one. You got a person in your mind, the most religious person you know, and Jesus says, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What in the world are you talking about? It's almost if Jesus is saying, you know that most religious person you know? The one that makes all the right decisions? Jesus says, if you don't become better than that person, you're never going to heaven. I hear those words, and I'm just ready to throw in the towel. You guys, amen to that? Like, you look at the most religious person you know, and you think, there is no way in the world that I'm ever going to stack up against that. I will never meet their criteria and if jesus wants me to be better than the best person i know then i might as well just throw in the towel right now and truth is if i'm being honest i don't want to try hard enough to be better than that person can i get an amen for that one yeah it's like no way in the world are we ever going to stack up and jesus says well then the kingdom of heaven is not for you what if jesus means something different and what if jesus means something else in matthew 5 20 than what we've typically thought about religion or moral choices well, i'm going to switch gears this morning and ask that you'll switch gears with me we're going to spend the rest of our time in a book called judges it's in the old testament if you have your bibles with you judges chapters 14 15 and 16 are where we're going to be reading out of and it's the story of this guy named samson Here's the thing about Samson. In all of Scripture, there are three people. How many? Three people whose birth was announced by angels. That's kind of a cool deal. All right, three people. The first one is a guy named Isaac. Isaac was the father of someone who's named Jacob, who became the founder of the nation of Israel. Pretty important guy, right? There's another guy that we meet in the New Testament. His name is Jesus. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of him. Good. Okay, Jesus had, there were like a third of you with your hands up. I'm glad you're here today. I'm going to introduce you to my best friend. His name's Jesus. He's a great guy. The second guy, okay, his birth was announced by angels. And then there's this third guy. His name is Samson. And it's weird to me that those three men are the only men in all of Scripture who have their births announced by angels. And I'm wondering if Samson is in that club of only three people, then surely there has to be something really good about him that we can learn from. Agree? Agree? Agree to that? Here's the problem, though. Samson was a loser. He's my people. Okay? And, and here's, what, here's what you need to know. When Samson is introduced in Scripture, the Israelites are at a really bad time in their lives. For 40 years before Samson is introduced, they had been under oppression by another nation known as the Philistines. The Philistines were like the Israelites' great enemy. Right? They were always at each other, the Philistines often getting the upper hand. And at this point in history, the Philistines were ruling over the Israelites, and it's almost as if the Israelites had just given up. And what we find in the Bible is that at that point in time, the Israelites weren't even praying to God about the situation. They weren't even on their knees saying, God, we've had enough, help us with this. It's like they just got lazy and comfortable with the fact that they were enslaved by their greatest enemy. Do you see a problem with that? And so Samson is introduced to cause this disruption in the way things are going down. Judges chapter 14 verse 1 says this, Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. 
When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. Typically not how dating begins these days. But Samson's out and about. He sees this woman. She must be hot. And he says to mom and dad, that's the woman I'm going to marry. And I want you to do something about it, right? And to us, culturally, that's weird. But in their day, it almost works like that, okay? Samson picks out a wife from afar and says, mom and dad, she's the one for me. Go get her. Listen to this, though. Verse 3 says, his father and mother replied to him, Samson, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines, a.k.a. our greatest enemy? Do you really have to get a wife from our biggest enemy? Samson said to his father, she's the right one for me. Isn't that just ridiculous? He's never met her. They've never had a single conversation. And he says, she's the one for me. Now, here's the weird thing. Verse 4 says this. His parents, Samson's parents, did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling over Israel. What Samson's mom and dad didn't know is that even though Samson was being bold and ridiculous and just plain stupid by saying, she's the one for me, what's going on is that behind the scenes, God is at work. That should be really important to us. Okay, in the midst of making bad decisions, even in our own lives, the truth is God is still... And we need to recognize the fact that even when our morals aren't up to par, and even if it doesn't seem like we are being the best people on the face of the earth, which is just not possible, the truth is God can still be at work in our lives. Now, what happens here is Samson ends up marrying this woman, the one that he says is right for him, the Philistine woman. He ends up marrying her. And what we find out is that Samson has this really big struggle with, with women. This time after time, we see him making really bad decisions with women. And, and this marriage didn't go well. Truth is, this woman manipulated and betrayed Samson. And they are actually at their wedding reception when all of this boils down. And Samson becomes irate, and the Bible says he basically storms out of his wedding reception, leaving his new wife behind. Now, here's where it gets good. We don't know how long later, but Samson comes to terms with his own idiocy, and he thinks, you know, I married that woman, and I'm going to reconcile our differences. So Samson comes, head held low, I assume, Chapter 15, verse 1, this is how it goes down. Later on, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. Isn't that the most romantic line you've ever read in your life? Hey, <laughs> uh, hey baby, I brought you a goat. Right? Hope it's the right color. I picked it out myself. But anyway, he brings this goat, and to us, it's like, what? What's this all about? This is the cultural equivalent to like a bouquet of flowers. And, and honestly, like Samson is coming to this woman and he says, you know, I want, I want there to be peace in our relationship, so I give you this goat, right? And, and as if that's not weird enough, here's what happens next. Uh, he said, he goes to his wife's house and she is still at her dad's house. And he says, I'm going to my wife's room, but her father or Samson's father-in-law would not let him go in. And he says this, I was so sure that you thoroughly hated her that I gave her to your friend. You hear that? Like they were at the wedding reception, things blow up, Samson storms off in a rage, a couple weeks, days, I don't know later, comes back with the goat and says, I want to see my wife. And his father-in-law says, oh, you haven't heard? I, because you stormed off in a rage, I... I thought you were gone for good, so your best man was there, and he's an eligible bachelor, so I hooked my daughter up with him, and they're married now. That's weird, but it gets even weirder. Now he says, um, isn't her younger sister more attractive anyway? Awkward. 
Are you following along? Uh, yeah, so dad, father-in-law says, so here's my younger daughter. She's hotter anyway, so just take her. Now, Samson traditionally has made... But here, for some reason, this just sets Samson off. He doesn't like this news, and he gets all heated and crazy. Verse 4, this is what happens. So Samson went out and caught 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. Anybody here trapped on a regular basis? Or semi-regular basis? Raise your hands. I need some help because I don't thank you. Okay, if you've ever trapped, ever, right? If you've ever trapped, what's the most successful night you've ever had? How many critters have you, have you caught? Most successful. Anybody? Three coons. Right? That's a good night, right? Caught, caught three coons. Now, Samson goes out and catches 300 foxes. That's a big deal. Do you think they're all just hanging out in the same place, like lined up like pee fast? Oh, pick me, pick me, right? No. Right, Samson has to put in a ton of work to, to, to trap these 300 foxes. And I'm willing to bet he probably didn't do it in one night. Why is this important? Because Samson is so enraged, he's so just bent on seeking revenge that he works tirelessly until he catches 300 foxes, he ties their tails together, and then he gets even crazier. This is what it says. He, he ties their tails together, fastens torches to every pair of tails. He lights the torches and lets the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. This guy is nuts. Not only does he catch 300 foxes, not only does he tie their tails together, but he lights them on fire and sends them, sends them out in the wheat fields so that their crop is completely destroyed. Farmers in the house today, how do you deal with that? Kill the guy, right? Hang him by his toenails in the city square. Do something. I seek revenge. This guy is mad. And why, why is this such a big deal? Exodus chapter 22, verse 6 says this. If a fire breaks out and spreads into thorn bushes so that it burns shocks of grain or standing grain or the whole field, what's it say? The one who started the fire must make restitution. Why do I mention this? Because Samson is an Israelite. Israelites were supposed to be concerned with what the law of God says. Samson basically could care less. Samson's living his own life, doing his own thing. He's like a you-do-you kind of guy. It's like one day somebody said, Samson, do whatever you want in life, and it'll be fine. He's like, all right, right? And he just goes out doing whatever he wants. He's self-centered. He has no concern for anybody or anything else. Verse 6, when the Philistines asked, who did this? Who burnt down our fields, right? They were told Samson did it, the Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his friends. Now, I don't know guys in the house if you would agree with me, but if, if I married a woman and my new father-in-law then turned around and gave her to my best man, I'd probably be on some rage too. Anybody agree with that? But this guy's, this guy's gone off the deep end. He's burned down everything they had, and they said he's the one who did it. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Wow. Their own people. Their own people take th this new bride of Samson and her father and they burn them to death as revenge for what Samson did to them. And what we find out in this chapter that it's this constant back and forth. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down and stayed in a cave in the rock of Edom. Back and forth. Samson seeking revenge. The Philistines seeking revenge. Even the Israelites get in on this a little bit. It's like this game of chess where they're just trying to one-up each other and ruin one another's lives. Samson hides in a cave, is betrayed by his own people, and then is delivered into the hands of the enemies again. And then verse 14, look what happens. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. And so they've, they've grabbed Samson. They found him hiding in the cave. They, they wrapped him up in these new ropes. They're leading him off to the Philistine in enemy. And as they do that, it says the Philistines came toward him shouting. Yeah, they're like, yeah, we got Samson now. He's tied up, right? The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. 
And so he escapes them, and then it gets good. Verse 15, finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down 1,000 men. Now, I don't know about you, but like after I have caught 300 foxes and tied them together and sent them out and burned fields down, and after I've been captured and tied by ropes and then somehow got out of those and slaughtered a thousand guys with the fresh jawbone of a donkey, after I do something like that, my very next move is usually I recite poetry. You guys, is that what you do? Is that where your heart and mind goes? Apparently that's where Samson's goes, because look what happens, verse 16. After he does all this weird, chaotic stuff, he says, with a, don- with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. As this guy has mental problems. Agree? Everybody agree with that? Yeah. One thing after another, he's just making weird decisions, and he seems so out of touch with reality. Now, this poem is kind of funny, but it's really perverse. And the reason it's really perverse is because the poem doesn't include a really important character in the story. It does not include God at all. Why do I mention that? There are three verses just before this. Read the red letters with me. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. So before this, Samson attacks a lion or a lion was trying to attack him and he, he kills him with his bare hands. A little while later it says, then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men. And then what we just read, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands three times. Three times we notice that Samson gets to experience some crazy power and there's no way in the world he can't recognize that it was actually God giving him the power. Yet, at the end of the day, he doesn't credit God for any of it. What about you? How many times does God work in your life and yet you fail to notice? And when when things start happening pretty well in your life, you think, man, I got it going on, right? Ain't no thing. Come at me, bro, right? I can tackle this. I, we look around at our lives and when things seem to be clicking, we think, we think we've got all of our ducks in the row that they should be in and so we succeed. And Samson was, Samson was there. Sure, he had some problems, but when things clicked, when things worked out for him, at the end of the day, he's like, ah, oh, man, I, I'm good. Right where, I, right where I should be. It's at times like that that we have to understand something, and that is that our own spiritual blindness leads us to believe that we know what's best in our own life. You do you, right? Live how you want to live. Make the choices you want to make. It sounds cool, but it's, it's completely blind to what's true. Judges 15, 18 says this. Now after all that happened, after he just slaughtered a thousand guys with the jawbone of a donkey and he recites this cool poem, the Bible says this. Samson was very thirsty. He cried out to the Lord. You hear that? This is the first time we ever hear of Samson praying. All those other times when he was fighting off a thousand guys, he didn't pray about it. Those other times when his wife had been taken from him and given to his best man and he was mad and angry, he didn't, he didn't pray about that. But when Samson is thirsty, he prays. Why is it that the most simple thing brings this guy to his knees? Why do you think that is? I would say it has something to do with the fact that he recognized for the first time that he couldn't do what he was doing without God. And so it says, Samson cried out to the Lord, you have given your servant this great victory. Please don't let me die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised, the the Philistine enemy. And God opened up the hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. And when Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. What we need to do is recognize our 
own need for God's involvement, just like Samson did that day. The problem, though, was that for Samson, it didn't last very long. In, in Judges chapters 14 and 15, we see three different times, three different times reference that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, and he was able to do something amazingly powerful. But when we get to Judges chapter 16, guess how many times we see that phrase used after that? None. Why? Because we find out that Samson was completely out of step with the Spirit. In moments like that, we must realize that trusting in our own abilities will only lead to our lives spiraling further out of control. For Samson, that's what happened. Judges chapter 16, verse 1 says this, One day Samson went to Gaza, where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. Just so we're clear, hiring a hooker and spending the night out of their house is not a good decision. Can we agree? Okay, good. If we haven't agreed on anything else today, I hope you'll at least agree with me on that. Okay? And so, isn't that weird that Samson goes from experiencing the power of the Spirit of the Lord, God's moving in his life, Samson finally falls on his knees and says, God, I can't do this without you. And then the very next day, I don't know what day, but the very next move he makes, as far as we have it in here, is that he spends the night with a prostitute. What is going on, man? His life spirals out of control because... He fails to, to trust God and instead just trust what he can do. Verse 4 says this. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. See that again? Samson, continuous problem with women in his life, making bad decisions with them. All you need to know about Delilah, this woman, is found in verse 16. It says this. With such nagging, she prodded Samson day after day until he was tired to death. I won't ask the women in the house if you ever nag your husband, because I know that you would never do that, right? But I do want to just to jump off the rails here just for a second. FFA crew and all the rest of the young single people in the house. Hey, this is important, I think. When we are involved in a relationship with someone else and, and that significant other constantly manipulates you with incessant nagging, attempts to control you and to control your thoughts, attempts to load you down with guilt and all this other kind of weight, I, I think we need to sever those ties. Adults in the house, would you agree with that? For the young, young peeps in the house today, yeah. And Samson, he saw, he saw what this relationship with these women was doing to him, but he just goes blindly into those relationships anyway. And what happens is, even though his strength was, was restored, he still allowed his own abilities to outweigh what God was doing in his life, and it led him into more disaster. Verse 21 of Judges 16 says, Then the Philistines seized him. You hear this again? They come at him again. They gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze shackles and they set him in to grinding in the prison. It's ironic that his spiritual blindness led to having his eyes gouged out physically. But there is good news. In the darkness, with his inability to physically see, something began to change in things. And, and what happened is repentance began to grow. The Bible says his strength was restored not because his hair was growing back, not because he was this big beast of a guy who had been lifting weights and pushing this stone around, but because he had this connection with God. Verse 28 puts it this way. Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me. Please strengthen me just once more. When Samson woke up, when he finally stopped trying to live his life by making decisions that he thought was best, when he stopped living his truth, whatever that means, when he stopped going by the motto of you do you, right? When Samson finally realized that all of those things were ending in failure and the only thing he had to rely on was God's power, then Samson has this turnaround moment. The story of Samson should teach us something. If God hears the prayers of an inconsistent, terribly immoral guy like Samson, who, who spent more time doing bad than he did doing good, then, then I think we can 
kind of put some stock in the fact that God hears our prayers too. And while we've been trying to, to live up here, right, to, to, to outdo the most religious people that we know, or even to throw our hands up in the air and say, I can't keep up with that anymore, what, what we really need to do is recognize that when we trust in our own abilities to do good, we will just fail. But when we trust in God's abilities to overcome those things by changing our motives, then we succeed. God's involvement in Samson's life had nothing to do with Samson's goodness. God's involvement in your life has nothing to do with your goodness. God's involvement in our lives has everything to do with God's goodness. When Samson admitted that he couldn't do anything worthwhile by his own power, God intervened. So you want to be a good person? Don't follow all of Samson's moves, but, but do follow one thing. Admit that God can use you better than you can use yourself. And then simply let him. We're going to move into a time that we call our invitation time. Uh, the worship team is going to come back up and, and lead us through a song. If you're here this morning, and you're at that point where like, you've just trying to been do, it, do it all on your own, you've, just, you've tried to be the best possible person you can possibly be, and it's, it's just not going anywhere, we're going to sing this song together, and we invite you this morning to allow God to use you. Allow God to overcome all of those things that you've been trying to do on your own, and allow him to use you right where you're at today. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for uh, Samson's story. It's kind of a weird one, and it's pretty crazy. And there are parts of it that we look at and just think, man, what in the world was that guy doing? He made some terrible choices one after another. But God, we see ourselves in Samson's story. Because God, we know that there are so many times we've tried to conquer this life by our own power and our own abilities, and we simply failed in those endeavors. God, I pray uh, today that wherever we're at, right where we're at, that, that we'll allow you to use us. That we will allow your abilities to overcome ours. And God, we trust in your spirit to work in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And then we just can't get it. Bye. 